to me, it feels like a ball. We're, we're getting everything ready and, and it's going to be a fantastic event. You know, if people buy or not, it's, 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 it's like the start of the season. <laughs> Well, Anne, it's great to see you. I'm so excited you're coming to Baltimore. Can you introduce yourself and tell us about your press? My name is Anne Aspinwall, and my husband, Knut Willig, and I run Aspinwall Editions. We started our printing and publishing business about almost 10 years ago, August 2012. And we both come from print backgrounds. I was previously uh, an etching printer at Pace Prints in New York. And before that, I was a print specialist at the New York Public Library. And Knut taught silkscreen and other print mediums for about 30 years at the, in Munster in Germany at the Fachhochschule. And we got married in 2010 and we'd been thinking and talking for a while about starting our own press. And he, he moved to New York to live with me, and the time was just right in 2012. And I had a studio um, in Manhattan on 39th Street near Times Square. Uh, I had an etching press. At the time, I was working primarily in collagraph and etching. And we used that studio space to invite artists to work with us there, where we could produce editions with them. And in order to do silkscreen printing, we had to go to Germany. Knut also founded about 20 years ago what's called the Print Association Bentlager. It is a, a nonprofit print organization that's based in, in an old farmhouse on the grounds of an 800-year-old monastery in Rheine, Germany. So in northwestern Germany, it's about two hours north of Dusseldorf and Cologne. So there's this monastery surrounded by woods and a river, and it's just an idyllic setting. And the old farm stalls for horses was converted into an etching and relief studio. And then the other side, which I believe also originally had animals in it and, and a hayloft, was converted into a silkscreen and litho studio. The time was right for us to start our own, our own press and Knut had been teaching silkscreen and the department where he was teaching, the university closed down the whole printmaking department and so also getting rid of equipment. He collected uh, a lot of these silkscreen tables and etching presses and whatnot over the years and really was, he and someone else founded this, this print association and he's been the chairman of it for the last 20 or so years. We would go there once or twice a year to produce prints with an artist. We started out with Jane Kent back in 2013. She was the first artist we printed and published for in, in Bentlager in Germany. So we spent two weeks together and it's intense but also it's there no distractions other than the woods around you. And so you live and work together and we get you know, a lot done in, in, in that amount of time. This was a wonderful way of working for a long time, mostly in New York, but also going to Germany for once or twice a year to, to produce was exciting, but it got to the point where it was, it was limiting because we could only do one or two projects in silkscreen a year. We spent a number of years trying to figure out if we could find a, a larger space in New York City. We really wanted a place where we could live and work under one roof and house, you know, invite artists to stay with us and work with us, similar to our situation in, in Germany. In September 2019, we looked at this property up in Hudson, New York, and it's an old 18th century farmhouse, 32 acres. And I thought it was absolutely nuts, and Knut thought it was perfect. <laughs> we closed a month before the pandemic in February 2020 and decided to renovate the house ourselves and build a studio onto the side. It's, in most respects, modeled after this print association in Germany, where it's surrounded by idyllic landscape, it's quiet, we have a lot of space outdoors and we will be able to invite artists to stay with us. We were fortunate to find this property right before the pandemic, but it is the worst time to be building. So this project has dragged on for, you know, we're way over our schedule, but we hope to be up and running this summer. For the fair, 
What we've been doing ever since we started is not just showing work that we print and publish, but also showing work by artists who make their own prints. For this fair, we are introducing to the U.S. public an, an English artist whose work we've been following for a number of years. Her name is Catherine Jones. She lives in London. She is just a, a wonderful and kind and very interesting and prolific printmaker. And she does all, mostly all of her own printing, and she works primarily in collagraph and also relief and some etching. And she is, she is just imaginative and fearless. And I've seen most of her prints through photographs, and she just sent us a, a tube and another package last month so we could start framing and getting ready for the fair before it could went to Germany. I worked in Collagraph for many years in my own work, but her her use of, of materials and textures, and she cuts out plates and assembles things on the press or through multiple plates. And it is I, I think the work is is just divine, and I'm so excited to to present it next next month in Baltimore. And she's someone we look forward to working with. We hope together here in Hudson once we're up and running, possibly combining collagraph and silkscreen, or you know, giving her the capability and of working on a larger scale. So so I'm, I'm excited to to present her work next month. Another artist we've, whose work we've been taking on consignment for the last five years or so is Susan Gothel Campbell. And she just, she has a show up right now in, in Detroit at David Klein Gallery. And some work that we have of hers from last year, it's a continuation of a series she's been doing called Lost Cities. And she does relief printing from birch plywood, primarily from wood blocks on pieces of Japanese paper. And she rolls up, she first roughens up the surface of the wood block, usually with a sandblaster, to really coax the grain out of the wood. And she rolls up the surface of the wood with, with ink, usually with a gradient roll so that you have, for example, deep turquoise to a very pale blue or in her earlier works from black to a um, you know, delicate gray. And so there's a range of tones and colors in the relief print. And then based on the nature and composition of the wood grain, she, she then coaxes out an aerial view or landscape using a Japanese punching tool. She perforates the paper in order to suggest lights, you know, nocturnal lights or highlights or streets or other thoroughfares and so it's this just beautiful combination of letting the wood grain suggest atmospheric qualities or landscape terrain and also her own hand in bringing out these highlights and this slightly more controlled network of grids or lights or whatnot and for these works, she's got two layers of paper. So the paper underneath is also printed in the same fashion from a wood block. And the perforations on the top sheet either expose the color of the sheet below or, or she punches both sheets so that you have the white of the background. She's someone whose work we've been following for a while and we've printed for her and we look forward to, to doing more work with her in, in our studio. I think people are always well, mm -hmm. artists who might listen to this will probably wonder how how you choose people and if you are open to receiving emails with links to portfolios and how does that work? We don't have one strict method of, of finding people. And actually, so we met Susan Campbell because Sarah Kirk Henley wrote me an email saying, I'm sitting in Susan's house. I think you two, I think she would be a great fit. Susan came to visit us and it was like love at first sight. You know, artists have approached us at fairs, other artists have sent us portfolios or, or digital images. At the moment, we have a list of artists we, we are going to work with for probably the next year. So, we, you know, know what's on our plate. But we also, we keep track of artists. We follow them for a number of years to see how their work develops. The process of working with an artist, there is um, 
a spirit of collaboration where the artist is willing to listen to our input and but we are always of course eager to hear what artists want to do with print mediums that we've never done before so yes we i would say we're we're open to to being contacted by artists i I do feel strongly that artists should do their homework first, but Knut and I both have to like the work, like the artist, and there needs to be a reason for working in print. I always ask printers and publishers how much they feel comfortable inserting themselves in the creation of a work by nudging an artist to make it more meaningful or contentful do you how do you how do you approach that well it's a really good question and it's, it's it's not always an easy process we've had um instances where we actually an artist approached us was interested in working with us and we followed her work for a number of years she decided that she was going to completely change the direction of her work and you know our interest was in her was based on what she'd been doing previously it's a delicate conversation that sometimes i'm really grateful that there are two of us because knut can be like incredibly blunt sometimes and he just he just will and he'll say what he thinks and for the most part people are grateful to hear his honesty whereas i agonize or how, how do i say this so at the same time if we're publishing a project and then we're also going to be selling it we need to confidently stand behind it and be proud of it we're very careful not to impose our wishes on an artist it really depends on the artist but we do offer our suggestions sometimes we we wait for the artist to ask for them but it's a really good question the fact that we have spent intimate time with the artists working on these projects we we're able to i think for the most part provide insight into the you know creation of projects through the conversations with the artists over extended periods of time we're able to really get to know why they made it of course how they made it and what the thinking behind it you know what the content is and so that's that is really helpful to us getting to know the artist is so important and so we don't do a back seat we're not don't just let them do whatever they want and we are very involved we feel also justified in nudging things a little bit because we're I mean to put it bluntly we're paying for it and we're we have to then go and sell it so we I think we're allowed to be involved. When I was acquiring work for the museum, I I always hoped that whoever was standing at the table at the fair would be mm -hmm. able to tell me what the there there is. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes you'd get somebody who's like, "Well, I we made an etching." I'm like, "Wait, no, you have to be able to tell me more than that." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the stories are so you know. Knut loves to talk and so people will come by our booth at the fair and if they let him he'll talk to them for 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 an hour and he doesn't care if they're going to buy anything and I think that's great cuz it could be students it could be people who say right off the bat look I'm not going to buy anything but can you tell me more about this and and he does and that storytelling is that flushing out of information is so important the people who come to the fair, well, who knows who's going to come this time, but traditionally mm -hmm. in Baltimore, the museum has fostered print collecting for years. The friends group that supports the print department there has been uh, active for more than 50 years. That's always been a hallmark in my mind of the fair here that you guys would always tell us later, like, these people know what they're doing. We don't have to explain why it's, you know, original <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. And so I hope that we get a wide range of people, the students, the, you know, and everything. And I still have a nonprofit museum brain. I want people to learn as much as they can and talk to the printers. And I don't know, I feel like it's commerce, obviously, but there's so much more to it. It's so much richer if you engage in my mind. Absolutely. And for us, this is the first fair since the pandemic, since March 2020. So I, 
uh, I'm so excited on so many levels to unite with people we know, other exhibitors we know, but also to see their work, to show our work, to meet the students who are you know, just starting out. We show uh, in New York at the EAB Fair every year. We've been showing it Art on Paper, but we love getting out of New York. Uh, we've, we showed it at Minneapolis a number of times, and it's just, it's, there's just a different atmosphere or vibe and also not competing when there are fairs in New York. There are usually several other fairs at the same time. And so people come through just exhausted and you just feel like you're propping up curators and giving them a drink or somewhere to put their coats. Which we always so. appreciate. <laughs> Baltimore's going to be great. We're so excited. I'm, I'm thrilled. And you, you've been doing such a fantastic job. I know this is not your first fair. You've you're you have a lot of experience, but I, you know, the attention to all of the details and you know your enthusiasm and the social media promotion is really it's it's huge because you never know. It's kind of a gamble every year. You think, are, are we going to sell? Knut and I always make a bet with each other at the start of every fair. You know, which is going to sell first and you know, I can't keep track of who owes whom what, but <laughs> it's a gamble. But but knowing that you and your team are, you have this infectious enthusiasm, it makes that so much more enjoyable for us, the whole preparation process. We do everything ourselves. It's just, it really is a two-man band here. So it's, 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 yeah, it kind of feels like we're getting ready for a ball. <laughs> To me, it feels like, yeah, it feels like a ball. We're, we're getting everything ready and, and it's going to be a fantastic event. You know, if people buy or not, it's, it's, this, it's like the start of the season. <laughs> I have to go find a dress. Yeah. Knowing that you and your team are you have this infectious enthusiasm it makes that so much more enjoyable for us the whole preparation process we do everything ourselves it really is a two-man band here so it kind of feels like we're getting ready for a ball <laughs> to me it feels like yeah it feels like a ball we're getting everything ready and it's going to be a fantastic event you know if people buy or not it's like the start of the season <laughs>